Good morning and good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for this important webinar. My name is Allison May, and I'm a research analyst with the Early Care and Education Project at the National Conference of State Legislatures, also known as NCSL. On behalf of NCSL, I would like to welcome all of you to today's webinar titled Suspension and Expulsion in the Early Years. In addition to our esteemed panel today, I am joined by my colleagues, Julie Poppy and Jenny Palmer. For those of you who don't know, the National Conference of State Legislatures is a bipartisan organization that serves the legislators and legislative staff from all states, commonwealths, and territories. NCSL provides research, technical assistance, and opportunities for policymakers to exchange ideas on the most pressing state issues. We operate from offices in Denver, Colorado, and Washington, D.C. The Denver office handles state policy research and the D.C. office works at the federal level on behalf of states' rights and interests. This webinar is a platform for information exchange. We are aiming to make our 60 minutes together as interactive as possible. There will be time for questions and answers at the conclusion of the presentations, and participants can ask questions at any time during the webinar. Please enter your questions in the Q&A chat box on the bottom left-hand side of the screen and specify which speaker you are addressing in your question. As a way to begin building some comfortability with the chat function, and also just as a way to see who's on the line today, I welcome you to type in the state from which you are calling now. I already see that a handful of you have done that. So for others that haven't, feel free to just mention what state you're, you're joining us from today. I'd also like to draw your attention to the webinar resources available today. At the top right of your screen, you'll see an icon that looks like a square piece of paper with a play button on it. As you mouse over this icon, you will see the words, show me the media library. If you click on this icon, you will be able to access a PDF of the slide deck we're using and a relevant handout. For access to all URLs within the presentation, I welcome you to access and download the PDF where you can easily visit the links. Alternatively, the PowerPoint presentation is also on NCSL's website. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be available on the NCSL website by next week as a video archive. On the screen now, you'll see an agenda for our webinar. As you can see, we have a packed agenda. In a few minutes, we'll hear more about suspension and expulsion in the early years. We'll provide a review of what we know from the research on and dimensions of early childhood expulsions and suspensions and the potential role of state policy and supports. We'll then explore some state examples and hear from legislators that have been a part of their state's legislative agenda to tackle early childhood expulsions and suspensions. I should mention that during the 28 legislative session, 2018, excuse me, legislative session, at least three states did introduce related legislation. Again, at the end of the presentations, we will have time for questions and answers. Today's webinar is the first of two webinars this summer that are part of NCSL's Early Learning Fellows Program. Because this topic is so important and timely, we've also opened up registration to others that are not part of this program. Since this webinar is part of the Early Learning Fellows Program, we will be prioritizing questions coming from our fellows and asking them first. On your screen, you can learn a bit about NCSL's Early Learning Fellows Program, which began in 2011. Our seventh cohort includes 30 legislators and five legislative staff representing 23 different states. Participants were selected through a rigorous application process. Our kickoff meeting was held last month and we'll have a second face-to-face -face meeting late in August. We have had over 200 NCSL members participate in this program since inception. I welcome you to learn more about the program on our website. Now let me just introduce our presenters and then I'll turn it on over to Carrie. Um, so Carrie McCann is the Assistant Director of State Services for the BUILD Initiative. She supports state leaders to design and develop effective early childhood systems and set policy that guides implementation of services for children birth to age five. We're so happy to have Carrie and her expertise on the webinar today. Senator Omar Aquino is from the great state of Illinois. Senator Aquino has been in his role as a, Senate, as a state senator of the second district of Illinois since 2016. 
He was born and raised on the northwest side of Chicago and attended Loyola University, where he received degrees in criminal justice and sociology. He was a legislative assistant in the Illinois House of Representatives and eventually moved on to work for Congresswoman Tammy Duckworth as her outreach coordinator. He is also an NCSL 2018 Early Learning Fellow. Senator Peggy Lehner is serving her second full term as the state senator for the 6th Ohio Senate District. Previously, she served one term in the Ohio House of Representatives as well as 10 years as a member of the Kettering City Council. This legislative session, Senator Lehner has been appointed to her fourth term as the chairwoman of the Senate Standing Committee on Education. In addition, she is vice chair of the Standing Committee on Education for the National Conference of State Legislatures, is a member of the NCSL International Education Study Group, and in 2016, she was chosen to participate in the Aspen Institute's Equity and Education Summer Institute, as well as in 2016, she participated in NCSL's Early Learning Fellows Program. And last, but certainly not least, we have Senator Gail Manning, who is serving her second term in the Ohio Senate, where she represents the residents of Huron and Lorain counties. She currently serves as Majority Whip, Chair of the Joint Education Oversight Committee, as well as Vice Chair of the Senate Finance Committee. Prior to running for Senate in 2010, Manning spent 37 years as an elementary school teacher. She participated in NCSL's Early Learning Fellows Program in 2016, along with Senator Lehner. Now we'll hear from Carrie McCann from, Build, from the BUILD Initiative. Carrie, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Allison. I'm so happy to be with all of you today. As part of my overview, what I would like to do is provide a brief um, review of the research, explore three dimensions to understand why expulsion is happening, and the potential role of state policy. So let's first start with definitions. You know, it's not often called expulsion in our preschool, special education, and child care settings. Instead, it's often, please pick your child up early today, or why don't we take a break and don't bring her in tomorrow? Why don't you have him join us for a half days for the next few weeks? Well, you know, our program is, is just isn't right for your child, or we can't provide the services that your child needs. You know, there are two um, organizations that have provided very straightforward definitions to understand the exclusionary practices that be, could be happening in programs. Caring for our children is the nationally rec uh, recognized resource for all child care programs across the country, and the Program Leader's Guide is specifically a guide and an assessment tool for programs to assess their practices on how to reduce expulsion and suspension in their program. What I wanted to highlight for you is two things that they uniquely do within their in their definitions. The first one is for under the program leader guide, you see the last bullet point that they really coined the term soft expulsion. And I wanted to highlight this concept of that it's technically the family who terminates the services and pulls their child out of the program, but it's often due to the behaviors of the, the program. So that's when you kind of see the introductory statement, please come pick your child up early today. If you do that several days in a row or several weeks in a row and you have a low income working parent and they don't have flexibility in their job, they're going to have to pull their kid out of the program and figure something out so that they can get to their work. Um, so we want to make sure that our policies and strategies are not do aggravating soft expulsion. The second thing I want to acknowledge in caring for our children from their straightforward definitions is they acknowledge other kinds of things programs could be limiting based on children's behaviors and that these things are not helpful and uh, probably don't improve behavior, but to acknowledge that there are other kinds of things that could be happening in the program, like denying outdoor time, withholding food, or using food as a reward and punishment. So what does the research tell us? Well, first and foremost, uh, suspension and expulsion is a stressful and negative experience within itself and can negatively impact child outcomes. The earlier it happens in a child's education predicts actually later expulsion and suspension. So you can see here it's not predicting anything that's positive. So expulsion and suspension obviously is not a useful tool in helping children be successful. And that young children who are expelled are more likely to drop out of high school, fail a grade, or be incarcerated. And so how often is it happening? Well, the seminal research from Walter Gilliam in 2005, he surveyed publicly funded preschool classrooms across the country 
um, and then participated in later studies that started looking at other child care settings. And what he really found nationally is that there's a preschool rate that's three times higher than K-12. And then you can see that in child care, it can be up to significantly higher. And what those numbers represent is how many children per thousand are being expelled in the previous year. Recently, there was a 2016 national study that instead of teachers being surveyed, it was parent report, and they found a rate of about 250 kids per day being expelled from programs across our country. And so how do we think about what increases the likelihood of expulsion happening? And there's really kind of three strikes to think about. In Gilliam's research, he really found that the first strike is that if you're an older boy. So boys are three and a half times more likely than girls to be expelled four-year-olds are 50% more likely than three-year-olds. Strike number two really has to do with race. So what he found was that there was about an expulsion rate of two times the rate of white children. The civil rights um, uh, department out of the Department of Education has additional information around suspension. They found that black children make up about 18% of preschool enrollment around our country, but represent 48% of the children suspended more than once from their preschool setting. The third strike is really the characteristics of the setting. And so this is about what increases the likelihood of expulsion happening. So the higher the teacher-child ratios are, the higher the likelihood of the expulsion. Uh, they found that in classrooms with teachers that reported feeling highly stressed, they're three times as more likely to have expelled a child in the previous year. Extended day programs have about tripled the rate of expulsion. Um, the rate of expulsion. Um, additional studies found that if the setting has too little structure, like there's no plan for the day, there's no posted schedule, no use of a curriculum, or make too restrictive a structure, so children do not have choice or options without throughout the day, that those increase the likelihood of expulsion. Uh, Gilliam also found that if programs can't access supports like mental, a mental health consultant, that increases the likelihood of expulsion. And then in this last one, that private programs that are less likely to have as many regulations also have higher rates, which may explain that child care bar graph that we just saw. I also wanted to raise the issue around infant and toddler. I highlight these studies um, to to encourage all of us to really think about this across the age continuum. We don't have the same level of research to understand infants and toddlers, and are they being expelled for similar reasons, or are there similar characteristics to expulsion and suspension for this younger age group? But I think I raise it so as we think about our work and our strategy over time, that we probably want to look at the birth to five continuum, as well as think about childcare and preschool settings. All right, so as we consider strategies um, that states can do to prevent expulsion, let's explore three dimensions um, that will continue to help highlight maybe why this is happening. And the first dimension is really to think about our workforce's knowledge of child development. So let's remind ourselves, right, that children's social emotional development occurs in the context of family, community, and cultural expectations. And that challenging behavior is a part of typical child development, as probably a lot of us know, and that that challenged behavior actually offers us touch points, as coined by Dr. T. Barry Prazelton, where adults are to guide children's development from one stage to the next stage. There are cross-cultural differences in how children are encouraged to express and interpret emotions like anger, shame, and the exuberance of positive emotions. And so the concern is, is that expulsion and suspension can pathologize typical child behavior and increase the disparities that we're seeing. The appearance of challenging behavior is subjective, and teasing apart the reasons for such behavior can be difficult. There are factors contributing to a child's behavior maybe related to the child, to the family, to the program, or some mixture of all the above. Identification of behaviors as challenging is often based on an individual's adult perception of risk. The National Survey of Early Care and Education indicates that only about 20% of providers reported receiving training on facilitating social emotional growth in the previous year. And without enough professional development, it may be difficult to have skills in distinguishing concerning behaviors from those that are developmentally appropriate, but still challenging, and uh, mischaracterizing these behaviors could lead to inappropriate responses and result in unproductive labeling. The second dimension is understanding the racial disparities. 
Um, you know, a review of the National Early Childhood Longitudinal Study found that at kindergarten and three, black and white parents were equally rating their children's skills and knowledge and being persistent, how they approach their learning, social interactions, you know, some of the components that make up social emotional development, but that teachers rated the black students as having a dis distinct disadvantage relative to the white students. There was also a, a recent study from Walter Gilliam in the past year or so where he used eye tracking technology and that he found that preschool teachers, regardless of their race, tend to more closely observe children who are black, especially boys than white children, when they were expecting challenging behavior. White teachers appeared to hold black preschoolers to a lower behavioral standard, whereas black teachers held the black preschoolers to a higher standard and in general tended to recommend harsher exclusionary discipline. So these biases, though different, appear to be in common that they share the expectation that black children will have more frequent challenging behaviors. When he was doing this study, he also wanted to look at how does knowledge about the family help? So when teachers were provided background information about the children that may explain their behavior, teachers of the same race as the child showed greater empathy uh, for the child, which may have led to feelings that the challenging behavior could be improved. However, this information did not have the same impact on teachers of a different race than the child, who actually really rated the child's behavior as more severe. So the researchers concluded that for these teachers, maybe the background information may have led to actually feelings of hopelessness and a sense that the child's challenging behaviors are insurmountable. So I think the implication for this study is that for our work in building partnerships between programs and families, it won't be sufficient to just make sure that providers have more information on families' background. But I have to think about what kind of supports do programs need in understanding information and what, how they might use it to better support children and families in their program. You know, to, another way to think about the racial disparities is to think about that implicit bias is one of the explanations. You know, bias is a human condition. We all have it. It's triggered by our brain when we have to make quick ju judgments. It's influenced by our background, culture, and personal experience. It's kind of varied and can be different than our explicit um, opinions. Um, and it can be easily triggered under what they call under cognitive or emotional load. So as we think that some of our early childhood settings have teachers and staff working long hours with high ratios and high stress, they probably increasingly have to rely on quick judgments than in kind of planful ways of interacting with the children. In addition to thinking about that aspect of bias, then we also have growing evidence of research that show that boys who are black are perceived as less innocent, less human, and more deserving of punishment, and that this threat commonly associated with men may be generalized to boys as young as five. And um, in the materials that Allison highlighted, uh, citations to this research and more description on all the research I'm presenting can give you the background information for this. So as we look at the research from Standard, Stanford University that shows that underprepared early learning teachers are more likely to use punitive and rejecting discipline and are more likely to over identify children, especially children of color, for special education, discipline, and expulsion, what it kind of highlights is it combines our first dimension on teacher preparedness and support and how that interacts with the over identification of children of color. There are some ideas about how we can start countering these disparities. The Kerwin Institute really recommends supporting programs' ability to be, you know, to put in efforts that really give teachers and staff space to think about how they're responding to children and why they're responding to children and what tr children are trying to communicate over kind of quick intuitive judgment. So you can see here that programs are encouraged to have explicit procedures around discipline, um, that mental health consultation can help do this kind of reflective practice. And Arizona has great research on showing how their mental health consultation program not only reduced expulsion rates, but reduced the racial disparities within those rates. And then there's other kinds of supports that we could uh, have programs have, which is be able to provide their staff reflective supervision and tie coaching and implementation of professional development that they're, that they're receiving specifically to their setting and the group of children that they're serving. 
And then lastly, but not least, is the third dimension, and this is about children, and that children can come to the situation with social emotional concerns or have experienced trauma, and that their challenging behavior can actually be a cry for help if something else is going on. And what I wanted to raise here is that our conversation can not only be in the state about how do we connect children who have experienced these kinds of things to maybe the kind of specialized services that they and their families might need to help deal with the kind of traumatic experiences that they have had. But it does also to acknowledge that we want the children to continue being in early learning experiences, that it's good for them, their parents still need to work, um, but that the quality of the early learning center becomes even more important, that the children who have experienced trauma have less resilience and tolerance for lower quality of care, and so the kind of care that we want for all children becomes much more important for this group of children. So my reflections for you is that expulsion is not a child behavior, it's an adult decision, that eliminating expulsion is the goal, but not necessarily the policy, and that it's, a single fact, it's not a single factor problem, that the complexity that I just presented really requires a multi-prong approach and a set of supports from the state level. And why does it feel complex? I think my summary for you is that there's subjectivity and how adults perceive behavior and what's considered challenging, that there's many different types of exclusionary practices as we kind of saw in the definition, that program characteristics may provoke or contribute to children's behaviors, but it's kind of hard to reflect on that contribution when you're kind of in the middle of the situation, um, that we have increased understanding of why racial disparities exist, and that our, across our country, there does tend to be a lack of support for the early childhood workforce. So what is the role of state policy? And so I have this chart for you to think about what could be the components of a state strategy. There's no state that's doing work in what you see here is all the blue squares. Um, what you see them is though is categorized. So there's a set of components around thinking about who's putting this work together, what's the goal, and how are you using data to track whether you're having the impact you want to have. There's a set of ideas around what's the level of policy that you want to have at the state level and at the program level. Um, and then the last two are what are the series of kind of supports that you would have for programs and then the kind of ser additional services that you might need for some of the children. And that this is all undergirded, undergirded by uh, the cross-cutting issues of wanting to build stronger partnerships with families and programs and really approaching this work so that we're promoting the racial and gender equity and taking all the disparities that we see in the data. There's no, I think, right combination of these strategies. Really, each state has to identify its strength, where it has momentum, and what makes sense for its next steps. There are some possible roles of legislation, and I think we'll hear some of them in a few minutes. So one is, are there funding or program components that are already in statute around preschool and child care that could be updated. So I think as you think about Gilliam's research and kind of the setting characteristics and what does our financing support in the kind of settings and what they're able to offer children as well as things like practical things like ratios, could those things be adjusted? A second idea is what data could be collected. Very often in our states where child care, where preschool, maybe where our quality rating improvement system, other aspects of early care and education actually lay across two or three different state agencies. So there's an idea of like could legislation help multiple state agencies come together and agree on a set of data. It could be around prevalence of what's the rate in your particular state and is it changing over time. If you do have supports that's checking out what's happening in programs, are you collecting data on discovering what's happening so you can better target your supports and what things may be added or not needed over time. And then this kind of idea of like are the supports doing what you hope they are supposed to be doing. A third idea for legislation would be what would be some specific supports that you would want to see happening, right? So we'll hear, uh, I think, from one state about professional development and what's the kind of cadre of resources being offered to our workforce as they become teachers and child care workers and then during their career, what kind of support? Are we getting people past kind of the 101 
um, aspect of their training and professional development. And then early childhood mental health consultation has really been shown as a key strategy to help reduce expulsion and suspension and maintain children in programs. And many states either have partial programs or have started programs. So the thought about either creating one or expanding them statewide may be part of a strategy over time. And then the last one is around, are there kind of clear expectations that you want to have of programs and are there protocols or procedures that you want to require of state agencies or of programs to put into place before things like expulsion would ever be considered? So here's a brief state example for you. So Arkansas um, developed a policy and it's actually at the state agency level and it simply says no child shall be expelled without permission from the Department of Human Services where their child care and early care and ed department lives. Um, they, um, and they oversee child care subsidy, publicly funded preschool, and they have the Head Start Collab office. What they created that's new is that they kind of have a hotline. It's actually an online triage form that a, a provider or teacher can fill out to say that they're worried about a child, because they think there's risk of expulsion. The policy that says um, that you, you can't expel a child without permission, what it requires you to do is actually access this triage um, hotline and accept the help that is, will be delivered through it. Um, and so you contact the triage and it can be the provider directly themselves and that's what it is in the majority of cases, but a parent or a pediatrician or somebody else in the child's life that's worried about what's happening in the program can access the system. It's open to all um, programs, childcare and preschool, but it's required of those programs that they oversee. So it's required of programs receiving subsidized childcare, preschool and Head Start. When they, they get a call back within 48 hours to have an interview, and the interviewer decides, does it sound more like kind of program level issues, some um, more direct support is needed, they'll send it to technical assistance. If it sounds like more complex case, maybe trauma, uh, there's an inkling that trauma has been involved um, or the child has multiple systems already involved like special education and child welfare, then they'll send out the mental health consultant. They implemented this, um, they're just closing out their second uh, year, so they've had more than 600 children referred across those two years. I think that data is from early spring, so it, it might be higher at this point. They've received referrals for children across the age range from as young as age one up through school age because of childcare being up through 13, but that the majority of those children are four and five years old. 82% of them were boys and 37% of them experienced some kind of significant trauma. So you can see that more about 70% or a little less of the cases really had to do with program and how they were understanding and responding to children. And then, then there was about 37% of the cases of that trauma was involved. They've been able to avoid expulsion in more than 90% of those cases. Majority of the children were maintaining their program. The technical assistance or consultants helped uh, do some positive transitions for some children who required higher quality of care. And then there's a smattering of cases where kids have either left for various reasons, the program decided to still move forward with expulsion and had the consequences with the department, or some families kind of got tired and just pulled their kid out of the program. This state is also uh, has core six training, so they're working kind of on the professional development of the workforce, and they're busy evaluating um, their program and supports over time. What I wanted to highlight for you is that most of this work has been about redeploying existing staff and resources. So there are triage specialists who are doing those interviews, all come from various units within the Department of Human Services. So it tends to be their experts like preschool specialists and others who have experience working with programs. They've been um, supported and given training on how to conduct the interviews. The one place where they added resources was to expand their early childhood mental health consultants. So Arkansas is a relatively small state. They originally had, I think, somewhere between five or six mental health consultants, and now they're up to about 14 so that they can cover the state more um, equitably. Um, all other uh, services, so that technical assistance I mentioned is covered by 25 or 30 people that they identified in the state, either some of their best trainers, maybe part of their quality rating improvements 
system specialists? Like, who were their best people who knew something about the design of early childhood programs, knew about social emotional development? And so th they have agreed to add this as a component of their job. So it's now as, as other duties are assigned that they have taken this on. So they still have their original job, but now part of their job is to go out to programs, see what's going on for the child, um, and help the program. Uh, make the kind of improvements or reflections or that kind of thing that they need to do. Um, and that the early childhood mental health consultant work is primarily funded through child care development funding grant from the feds or their state pre-K quality improvement dollars. I did want to mention that that pays probably for them about 80% of the consultant's work. So most of the mental health consultants work a four-day week as a consultant, and then one day a week they're in their community mental health agency providing clinical services and billing Medicaid for those services. The stipulation is that they just can't um, refer themselves cases that they're consulting on. So it's one strategy that the state has been able to do to fully fund full-time these positions while trying to figure out how to juggle the funding that they do have around. The other thing I wanted to acknowledge is that I see in a lot of conversations around the country that Conversations often start and end with what Arkansas has found to be 37% of their children, children who have significant social, emotional or experiences or concerns, and that what is it that we're going to do for them and the programs that serve them. But I think what you see is if we start and end our conversation there, we really miss almost 70% of the cases, which is really work with programs on their quality, how they've set up and designed their classrooms or programs, how they're responding and understanding to children and their behavior. They're receiving targeted coaching on training that they've already received but may not have necessarily implemented or didn't see how the strategies apply to this particular child and situation, and that they're really receiving support on how to uh, work with families in different ways. And so I think it's that kind of work that will help us significantly reduce the expulsion rates that we've been experiencing um, over time. So as we look at this chart again and think about what do we know about where states are taking action, this is not an all-inclusive list and every day I'm learning about a new thing that another state is doing. But we do have states who are taking on data. We're going to hear from Illinois and the legislation that they passed about data being annually collected from all licensed programs. For many states like Colorado, Maine, Virginia, New Mexico, New York, and others, uh, they've been working on their prevalence and understanding where providers are coming from by doing anonymous surveys. Many of these states have worked with the National Center for Children in Poverty on the design and administration of those surveys. Um, and then there are states who already have some data on some of their support. So there's a lot of states who are pyramid model states who are implementing professional development, and so they're already collecting data on how that professional development is impacting practice between teachers and children. And many states have early childhood mental health consultation and may be now adding specific data points to track impact on reducing expulsion and suspension. Um, in the policy bucket, that first red circle you see should actually be around the top square because really a majority of the work that we're seeing across states is the decisions each state is making about what kind of state level policy to have. So you can see that Arkansas made a decision to have it at the state agency level, but that was because early care and ed programs were really unified under one state agency. There's um, states like Maryland and uh, Illinois who have passed uh, legislation that really require programs to go through their own steps of observation, engaging parents, and accessing existing mental health consultation, so it's less centralized than the triage model that you see in Arkansas. Many states have started out with banning it, um, but are now struggling with how to monitor it and, what, and that they hadn't really thought about what supports the programs need to be successful in meeting that ban. So while the policy is right for children, it, it didn't really take into consideration uh, what we need to do to help adults be able to no longer expel or suspend young children. You can see here that there are some states that are working on kind of work um, conditions, so that's trying to address teacher stress, well-being, what kind of conditions are people working in, how do you handle offering a long work day to families but not have that aggravate the likelihood of expulsion. South Carolina is just in the early stages of figuring that out and there's a lot of resources out there for programs about thinking about their organizational climate. 
And then a lot of states are doing works in the kind of support area. So we see Arkansas, Ohio, and Maine have some kind of hotline, right? Arkansas has it online. Ohio has a children's hospital actually manning a telephone. Uh, Maine has a warm line that was designed for occlusion, but most of the calls that they're receiving is around behavior. Um, you have a lot of states like Georgia who are implementing the pyramid model, so are really thinking about that training component that you see. Um, there are states like Ohio, Colorado, Arkansas, and others who are thinking about what's the package of professional development that we want to put together, what are the four or five topics, and how do we develop people's expertise expertise over time. Um, many states have early childhood mental health consultation and are using that or expanding it. Uh, there's great resources at Georgetown uh, or the Center for Excellence that can offer states resources. Connecticut is doing an experiment with some of their preschool programs about can they offer a time-limited mental health consultation model before children are flagged with behavior concerns and kind of prevent it from problems ever existing. And then you have states like Maine, Connecticut, and Washington who are thinking about all the TA providers that may at any given point in time walk into an early care and uh, education program like licensors, QIS, TA specialists, mental health, health consultants, infant toddler specialists, and what's the common knowledge and skills that they want across all of those TA providers and do they know where to send programs for help if they need it. If you're looking at that chart and kind of overwhelmed and thinking about how would a state kind of work through those, there's actually this tool at this link that's published by the State Capacity Building Center. That's an assessment tool where a state can actually literally see suggested strategies, rate what you're already doing, what you're not doing, and then make decisions from there about priorities and what best makes sense. So my closing reflections for you is that really hopefully the focus of our work is how do we build the capacity of our workforce and the kinds of support that the workforce needs, that the next steps that states are doing is really a, a combination of what's the few things that need to be new, kind of like Arkansas decided that they needed a tri triage system, um, but that a lot of the work that we're already doing, we just need to bring an expulsion prevention lens to our professional development work, to our QRIS, to what are the other supports that we already have in our state. I think we've learned from Arkansas to please, you know, involve all helpers and experts that exist in the state and to not be overwhelmed by the complexity. Every state is picking a starting point and building momentum from there. So I will stop there and uh, thank everyone for, for participating and I'll turn it back over to Allison. Excellent. Um, Carrie, thank you so much. Uh, that was really informative. I think that in the interest of time, we'll just keep moving along and then as questions come in, we'll ask them um, or just hold till the end after we hear from our legislative respondents and we can have a little Q&A. So next up we have the Senate, excuse me, next up we have senators from Illinois and Ohio who have been part of legislation in their state designed to address suspension and expulsion in the early years. So first we're going to hear from Senator Aquino a member of NCSL's seventh Early Learning Fellows cohort from the great state of Illinois. He'll share with us an overview of the legislation and what it aims to do for Illinois students. Additionally, he'll provide some context around how this legislation came to be by highlighting the evolution and conversations had within the state. Um, might also mention some implementation and some, uh, some potential pitfalls or things that others on the line that are interested in this kind of legislation in their state might want to watch out for. And then after Senator Aquino, we're going to transition and hear similar comments from Senators Lehner and Manning from Ohio. Uh, Senator Aquino, the floor is yours. Allison, thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, so uh, my name is Omar Aquino. I'm a state senator in Illinois. And so I was the co one of the co-sponsors of House Bill 2663. And I also serve on the Senate Education Committee. So I was able to sort of see this bill through um, to its passage and eventually when it got signed into law in 2017 during um, our uh, 100th General Assembly. And so House Bill 2663 essentially prohibited the expulsion of children enrolled in early childhood programs receiving grants from the Illinois State Board of Education. Um, it was an initiative of the ounce of prevention um, and so it essentially it, it stated that there is a lack of uniform standards surrounding the uh, expulsions and suspensions in early childhood settings and it would 
having a negative effect on, on children, um, a negative effect not only on, on their education, but it, it you know, leads to uh, negative effects in health and developmental outcomes throughout, uh, as noted earlier uh, by Kerry. Uh, much of the research uh, showed that, um, that there's a um, expulsion, exp- exp- excuse me, and suspensions at early childhood as, as, uh, uh, um, centers at, a, at an alarming high rate. Specifically in Illinois, preschoolers were expelled at a rate three times that of their older peers. And it was particularly high for, for boys and, it's, uh, and high rates for minority children as well. And so essentially the, the bill is providing protections for children in publicly funding early childhood settings against preventable expulsions and suspensions, similar to those uh, in K-12, through which was a bill that was worked on in the previous General Assembly, which I'll go over in a little bit. It also uh, provides early childhood professionals and administrators access to necessary professional development, training, and technical assistance to recognize and address implicit biases, as well as support children with uh, challenging behaviors. And lastly, it's set to um, it strengthen data collection and dissemination by agencies uh, funding early childhood services to help inform agencies, uh, lawmakers, and advocates, and guide policy and practice uh, planning. So. Um, we had already, as, as mentioned earlier, we had already improved uh, the expulsion and suspension practices for K through 12 through Public Act 99046, uh, which, which was Senate Bill 100 in the 99th General Assembly. Um, I, I, I can't really uh, talk about House Bill 2663 without mentioning Senate Bill 100 because it really laid the groundwork for. Um, for 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 the for this bill to to, um, to essentially prohibit the um, the ex, uh, expulsions and suspensions for early uh, childhood centers, uh, we first had to work with our K through 12 system. And so this bill, Senate Bill 100, was something an initiative of the uh, the same chief sponsor of of um, of House Bill 2663. My uh, good colleague, uh, Senator Lightford, and she had been working on this piece of legislation for over two years. It was uh, initially a, a initiative of a group called Voices for Youth in, in uh, Chicago Education, or VOICE, and it, it was an attempt to address the racial disparities in Illinois' education system with regards to expulsions and suspensions of students, specifically through K-12. through The legislation um, was uh, a, a hundred was something that was uh, tried to uh, be done two years prior with Senate Bill th- uh, 3004 in the 98th General Assembly, which was not successful. But the chief sponsor continued conversations over the 2014 spring legislation session uh, with voice school management and law enforcement uh, to, to end up reaching a negotiated bill. Uh, the impetus of that was that in 2012, we saw that there was a federal uh, uh, civil rights data that found that Illinois sus- uh, had suspended proportionally more African American students than any other state in the U.S. Um, and so it, it was interesting to see how data had influenced us almost in, uh, in, in an embarrassingly way to say, you know, to show that how Illinois was so behind, uh, uh, behind in, 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 uh, in terms of suspending uh, students and expelling them so much, a lot to do with, um, uh, especially in K through 12, with zero tolerance policies that were implemented. And so, um, so Senate Bill 100 set up for, um, for, for with its passage and eventual signage uh, into law, uh, House Bill 2663, where the ounce of prevention saw like, well, this initiative that was taken up for K through 12 and in really trying to pro- um, not necessarily prohibit um, expel- expen- expulsions, excuse me, and suspensions, but limit it, uh, and why not take that into uh, early childhood centers as well? And so, um, this uh, House Bill 2663, because of a, a lot of the work and negotiations that were happening with the previous legislation of Senate Bill 100, uh, had a lot of bipartisan support, had a lot of support from, uh, as I said earlier, it was an ounce of prevention initiative, but the Illinois chapter of American uh, Academy of P- Pediatrics, the Sergeant Shriver National Center on Poverty and Law, and many others were, were proponents of the legislation. The, the lone opponents, and, and I can't really say that they really worked very hard against it, but was the School Management Alliance, uh, um, which uh, part of their, um, th- uh, their issue with, uh, with House Bill 2663 was um, that it had, they 
were against uh, because of, of uh, essentially a mandate, an unfunded mandate that they termed that this bill was. But um, that's how that's what they sort of felt it was. But um, proponents of it just you know basically uh, uh, noted that it wasn't actually an unfunded mandate because many of the practices that the bill had prom- uh, were promoting and already were already implemented by many of the high quality early learning programs across the street. Uh, across the state, rather. In addition, uh, mental health consultation services and trainings were generally already available within these systems, and so nothing in the bill actually required programs to go out and find and pay for any additional resources. The requirements on providers were simply documenting uh, steps taken to ensure that a, a child uh, could participate safely in the program, utilizing uh, community resources, and if available, and deem necessary in creating transition plans for students, uh, which is a system-wide best practices that should not be uh, require any additional funding. The intent of the bill was not to punish providers, but more to um, offer them a framework of how to handle children in challenging behaviors and, and, and uh, or with challenging behaviors, or provide uh, um, and or providers exhibiting implicit biases. Um, secondly, the, another question that was sort of asked by, by many, or by some rather, were why would you eliminate the option to expel? Um, uh, you know, why make kids stay in bad situations? And so the, the, the answer to that was that, you know, you know, we know that uh, not every early childhood setting is right for, you know, every young child. And the hope of the legislation was to protect some of uh, the children from improper removal while improving transition processes for those who may benefit from placement in a different setting. And the bill also set forth a process by which the chances of removal of a child from a program due to behavior would be significantly minimized and ensure that removal would not be the first and only option explored. Uh, nothing in the bill, though, precluded uh, any of the parents or legal guardians of the children to withdraw uh, his or her child from any uh, early childhood programs voluntarily. In addition, in the case of the determination of a serious safety issue or threat to a child or others, the temporary removal of a child from attendance in a group setting um, um, would may be used. Um, you know, some of the um, uh, uh, the the things to kind of take a look at is is you know this was uh, again this was spurred on from a, some some a legislation that had been worked on for many years to get for, uh, suspensions and expulsions down in the K through 12 um, education system and then uh, because of the success there it allowed for the advocacy and, and, and passage of House Bill 2663 a lot more easier than the Senate Bill 100. Um, you know, I, I think some of the lessons learned is, you know, it's key to utilize the, the data that, that, that is, is, is out there now. Uh, that's why it was so important that in both these bills, um, it was, uh, you know, that there's a requirement that there be reporting, um, public reporting of, 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 of this data so that, you know, moving forward, uh, we have best practices going, uh, and, and that we adjust policy, uh, you know, necessary, uh, when, you know, when necessary. Um, and, you know, an interesting thing that I, I had a conversation with my colleague who was the chief sponsor of this, and I asked her, what are sort of the things looking back that you think uh, were very helpful? And she um, had indicated that, you know, um, initially this piece of legislation, uh, specifically Senate Bill 100 and then uh, later on House Bill 2663, was uh, initiatives from specific groups. So the latter, 2663, being of the ounce of prevention and uh, the former of Senate Bill 100 being from voice. But a lot of uh, groups came in, into support later on. Uh, some, you know, Senate Bill 100 had several as well, but one of the things is that she utilizes that. Which I thought this was interesting because I'm a newer member and getting part of you know negotiating bills now um, is that she goes by a practice of only allowing for two people of opponents and, and proponents to to negotiate with her, and so that allows even though if there's more uh, proponents or opponents coming on board or, or dropping off, that they sort of negotiate within themselves so that when they are together they can come to some kind Consensus a little bit. I, mean, I thought that was just a little bit interesting, but nevertheless, I think the the, the biggest takeaway is you know if the you know we have these um, this data that is out there that you know that you know Carrie had had, had reviewed um, a lot of the research that has that has uh, um, been published recently, and it's really utilizing those uh, things to not only build consensus and support over. 
uh, reducing, you know, the expulsion and suspensions, which we know is right, but also showing how um, sometimes there's implicit biases and there's some um, unfortunate things that happen um, um, where it impacts negatively uh, a segment of, of, of our population. And so we need to make sure that we're righting those wrongs. But, um, you know, certainly um, would love to answer any questions at the end or, feel, you know, uh, the, anyone else would like to reach out to me. Uh, Allison, you feel free to uh, send my information on to, to others. So okay. I'll, uh, at this point, I'll pass it on to Allison. Thank you. That's great. Senator Aquino, um, that was terrific, uh, really rich information. We're going to transition a little bit and learn um, about the state of Ohio from Senator Peggy Lehner and Senator Gail Manning. Um, Senator Manning, or Senator Lehner, excuse me, the floor is yours. And don't forget to unmute yourself. How's that? <laughs> As Perfect. I was chatting. There you are. Right. Thank you. Okay, you're great. Um, I found that presentation very interesting because it parallels a lot with what we did in Ohio. But uh, basically our initiative, which is um, Senate Bill 246, um, was born out of frustration, frankly. My frustration over watching over a 15-year period, no real changes in our educational success. Progress seemed to be getting worse um, in spite of all of the focus that the national um, the federal government has put on reforms or in Common Core testing, all of these things, the needle just wasn't moving um, in any way for kids. And one of the things that I really started focusing on through my work with the International Study Commission at NCSL was looking at the fact that all of the other countries in this world which, with higher performing education systems had a robust early childhood program. And um, so I've been concentrating for the last six years or so on, on trying to elevate um, early childhood, quality early childhood programs um, in Ohio. But at the same time, I was questioning, what else is there that's fundamental to how we structure our system uh, here in the United States that we could look at um, to perhaps find some answers? Uh, what could we do better? What, what were we doing wrong? And it was about this time that I started hearing um, talk about the high rates of suspensions and expulsions in our schools. And uh, in, in 2014, for example, 2015, uh, we had 36,000 children under the age of eight suspended in our schools in the state of Ohio. That did not include the, the early childhood programs because that data wasn't being collected. And I thought it was interesting, Carrie was talking about soft expulsions, the suggestion that maybe this school wasn't quite right for Johnny, et cetera, et cetera. If you wrap all of those in, you can easily double that number of 36,000. And those kids tended to come out of poverty. These were kids with high numbers of ACEs in their lives. These were the very same children that we were seeing failing the third grade reading reading tests that we have in Ohio and going on to be high school dropouts. So I started looking at this whole issue of, of suspension expulsions and what we should do um, to prevent that, looking at it um, kind of the same way we looked at corporal punishment. We said, this is not good for kids. Let's get rid of it. It's a solution for adults, but it's not good for kids. And I think the same thing is true of, of um, suspension and expulsion. It's not good for kids. We need to find alternative pathways. We can't just take away a tool, and this is a tool that schools were using, without replacing it with something. And so that's why there's components in this legislation dealing with um, enhanced um, social emotional development, learning, professional development for teachers, both pre-service and in-service um, around um, 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 social emotional learning, trauma-informed instruction, and those sort of cultural competency. I'm going to turn it over to Gail right now to explain a little bit more specifically what um, Senate Bill 246 did. So Gail, take it away. She's probably muted too. <laughs> 
Senator Manning, are you there? If you unmute your line, we'll be able to hear you better. Hi, uh, can you hear me now? I can, There's loud and clear. Okay, good. Um, thank you very much, Peggy, and uh, thank you, NCSL, for uh, assisting us in this and, and many of the information that you do re uh, give to us. Senate Bill 246 basically clarifies that each school district, community school, and STEM school must implement a positive behavior intervention and support uh, system, which uh, we all refer to now as the PBIS framework, and it provides a list of potential objectives. Uh, it requires all teacher prep programs to include the PBIS instruction to students pursuing a license to teach in any of the grades pre-K through five. It requires each school district within the three years to provide professional developments in PBS to teachers and administrators of schools that are serving any pre-K program through third grade. And it requires each district to establish model courses and monitor a district's provisions of professional development in PBS. We've also made sure that includes a non-graded measure on the district or building's report card as a statement of whether the district or school has implemented the PBIS framework. It requires that students pre-K through third cannot be given an out-of-school suspension unless there's proposed suspension in a violation of things such as illegal possessing a firearm, carrying a concealed weapon on school property or school activity, illegal possession of controlled substance for the same reasons, uh, rape, aggravated assault, felonious assault, things like that, that uh, certainly make sense. Uh, complicity in the above violations, regardless of whether the act of complicity was committed on school property. But we also included for offenses not described above, but for which the school district determined suspension was necessary to protect the immediate health and safety of a student or for which the school district follow the requirements to receive a written recommendation that suspension or expulsion is the least restrictive method of discipline available based on the serious, uh, seriousness of the offense. We certainly understood, and you know, me being a teacher for 37 years, that you cannot have a child in a classroom that's being extremely disruptive, but we need to find ways of doing it differently than suspending them or expelling them. We appropriated $2 million in the FY19 for schools serving any of the grades pre-K through third to adopt and improve their programs for PBIS and social emotional learning curriculum. This prohibits out of school suspension or expulsion of students in grades pre-K through three for minor offenses, but delays full implementation of this pro prohibition until the 21-22 school year. We wanted to give them three years to make sure that everybody's been trained properly. During the tiered implementation phase, it requires each school district and school to annually report their out-of-school suspensions and expulsions in issues pre-K through third grade students categorized by the, by the type of offense that they have so we can kind of keep the data on this. Uh, we amended our bill, uh, Senate Bill 246, um, to make sure that this would be implemented immediately um, in the fall rather than waiting another year. So we um, amended it into House Bill 318. So if you're planning on doing any research along this area, uh, make sure you look up House Bill 318 where you'll find all of this information. And I'm going to turn this back to Senator Lehner that has a few more comments to make. Thanks, thanks, Gail. Um, one of the things I would like to talk about a little bit was um, how we prepared the legislature for this and some of the steps we took. We had a number of interested party meetings where we had the teachers, both unions, um, school administrators, and I, I noticed my colleague from Illinois referred to um, their school administrators being sort of the ones that were dragging their feet. We had a bit of that because our two were concerned about um, unfunded mandates, um, but we brought them on board at least to the point that they didn't object. They, they kept asking for more money, which we're used to. So other than that, they were on board. We had juvenile justice folks involved, very heavily involved, school counselors involved. One of my biggest surprises, frankly, was this, 
with this bill was how little opposition we actually had. We didn't have a single opponent testify against the legislation um, during the hearings in the Senate. And uh, I think partly that was um, because of preparation, but I think partly it's grown out of the growing recognition that social emotional learning, trauma-informed care, all of these things are major issues that we need to address in this country. And Ohio was ready to step up and do that. I think at this point, I'm gonna turn it over to Allison. I know we're running short on time. That was great. Um, thank you both so much uh, for your comments. We are running a little short on time, and so I apologize um, for everyone staying, but thank you for staying on. We don't wanna keep you longer than necessary. Um, if you have any questions for any of the people who spoke today, please feel free to contact NCSL, here's our contact information on the slide in front of you. Send us an email, give us a call. NCSL, we are here for you. So if you have questions, we can connect you to either of the senators or to Carrie, or we might have some answers, um, and we would certainly love to be of assistance to you. I'll share that this, this webinar will be archived, um, and we do have a webinar next month on the 18th looking at pre-kindergarten, um, on the 16th, pardon me, looking at pre-kindergarten. And you can find both the archive version when available and registration for that next webinar by, by clicking on the link you see on your screen. Um, two last things. One, we hope to see many of you in Los Angeles this summer. We'll be uh, in Los Angeles July 30th through August 2nd for NCSL's annual summit. We have a handful of really great presentations geared up and ready to go, but I'd call your attention to uh, a session Tuesday morning called Healthy Starts, Tools for Early Childhood Success. And then um, at the conclusion, you're gonna see a survey pop up on your screen, and I would welcome you to just take a few moments uh, to complete it. Your feedback really helps us in crafting the most meaningful presentations in the future. So again, thank you to our wonderful Presenters, thank you to all of you for joining uh, Early Learning Fellows. We look forward to seeing you later uh, this summer, both in Minneapolis and online at our next webinar. Have a great rest of your day, everyone. Thank you.